to the Animation Podcast, a weekly podcast about all things animation brought to you by Filmbook. My name is Matt Brunet, but some of you may know me as Animat from my YouTube channel, Electric Dragon 505, home of web series that are all about animation, including Animation Look Back and Animat's Reviews. If this is your first time here in the Animation Podcast, the title will go and explain everything for you. This is the Animation Podcast. Do you understand that? No? Then what the fridge is wrong with you, seriously? But anyways, it actually talks about the latest news that happened this week. So for example, in this episode, we are going into the announcement that Season 3 of Rick and Morty is starting to go into production while also giving us a funny new little video to tease us for it. Then afterwards, we will be looking into a little bit of an older news about the cast of the live-action reboot of The Lion King, or what's starting to form as the cast. Then afterwards, we will be entering upon a documentary that looks into the dark side of visual effects. Then afterwards, we will be looking into something called The Atom Project, which is a little robot that has a massive price. And then finally, we will end things off with Matt's Pick of the Week. If you want to check out more episodes of the Animation Podcast, then head on down to Filmbook, that is film-book.com, by searching the Animation Podcast. You can also email us at podcast at filmbook.com with the Animation Podcast in the subject line. And so, for our first story that we have right over here, we are going to be looking into Rick and Morty, which I would have to say, so far, it's probably the most highly praised show that is currently on Adult Swim. Or at least in the future, it could be one of the most, considering that the season f- uh, the, or the series finale of Samurai Jack is going to be coming soon. But so far, uh, the one that people keep an eye on so much on Adult Swim has to be Rick and Morty. And for a while, people have been waiting anxiously for the elusive season three. Now, they didn't wait as long as Samurai Jack for a new season to emerge. Uh, The last time that a new episode ever appeared from Rick and Morty has to be from October of 2015 for the end of Season 2. But we do know for a fact that Season 3 will be a thing, but it it, it just took so long. And apparently at the Sundance Film Festival, when one of the creators, Dan Harmon, was asked... Um, he was pretty much responded by saying that, uh, Rick and Morty keeps taking longer and longer to write, and I don't know why. So, apparently, there must have been something that's been going on behind the scenes for Rick and Morty. Not, not anything bad, but just, like, maybe thinking of too many new ideas or trying to figure out what to do in each episode. So, in terms of creativeness, it was probably a little bit hard to find all the new crazy ideas that they could do for Rick and Morty. And especially the fact that the longer that they hold it on, the more that this thing is being anticipated. However, Cartoon Network has officially reassured us that the production for Rick and Morty Season 3 is officially a go. It looks like now the script is pretty much all set for what's going on in the season, And now they can continue on with recording the lines, doing the animation, and all that kind of stuff. But on top of that, Adult Swim also provided us with a little fun YouTube video of uh, Rick and Morty. And it's basically a Rick Roll video. Now, I'm sure, probably, if you guys are listening to this, you know what a Rick Roll is. It's basically, like, you'd think it would be something, but then you click on it, and it turns out to be... A, mu- a music video of Rick Cashley's Never Gonna Give You Up. It's a great song, but it's all it's always funny. Like, you know, it's it's a cute way of um, of YouTube to say that you've been pranked. There was at one point even that YouTube uh, did this entire April Fool's thing that whenever you would click on a video in the homepage, it always redirects to you to a Rickroll. But in terms of what they did with uh, this one in particular, they didn't do any new animations or something like that. What they did is that they just took so many random clips of uh, Rick and Morty from season one and season two, and they combine and they pretty much combine it together so that all the characters seem like are saying the lyrics of uh, "Never Gonna Give You Up." Like 
you'll have like several characters just go there. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Never gonna run around and desert you. You know, stuff like that. It's actually pretty cute. Um, but that's pretty much the only thing that they have confirmed. Other than that, we don't really know any more information about it. We don't know if, uh, we don't know the plot about season three, what's going to be going on with uh, Rick and Morty's adventures, nor do we know any release date on, uh, season three of Rick and Morty. Like, we don't even know if it's going to be out either in 2017 or in 2018. But... With that said, um, this is definitely exciting news, at least to know that there is going to be something happening with uh, Season 3 of Rick and Morty. Uh, I remember watching some episodes myself, and it's definitely one of those shows that like, I'm, like, I, I definitely want to see a lot more. And um, I even said to myself that uh, at one point, like, I, I want to go and watch more episodes of these. And at least with my new New Year's resolution, like, I want to get into more TV shows. And I did. Like, I am starting. I've already went through Troll Hunters. Phenomenal series, by the way. Um, and so far with Rick and Morty, that's definitely right up there. And considering that it only has about... Uh, well, it's just two seasons. It's still, like, a, a mouthful. But, you know, it's still, like... At least it gives me reassurance that it'll give me enough time to watch these episodes before ultimately season three would come out. And then, like, you know, I could get back on track with many of the other Rick and Morty fans. But, yeah, uh, definitely, like, I've seen the I've seen plenty of episodes of Rick and Morty. And so far, I'm really loving it. And hearing that uh, a show like this is, de is continuing is definitely really awesome. And I do have to congratulate the efforts of uh, Don Harmon and Justin Roiland. So... Uh, this is definitely going to be a lot of fun. Who knows what could possibly happen, but at least it is reassuring to know that they are at a good pace and thing things are actually happening with Rick and Morty. So once again, just want to let you know, uh, no release date has officially been confirmed from either Cartoon Network or Adult Swim, but at least something is going to happen. At least we know that there is going to be a season three. Okay, so for our next story, admittedly, this is a little bit of old news. Like, this is the kind that's a little bit of a week old. But in the last episode, this news came out kind of like a last-minute edition, so I couldn't necessarily talk about it. But this is still something that I want to actually talk about, so it is actually worth it, and now I got my chance. Okay, so the thing is, is that this is regarding the live-action reboot of The Lion King. And I remember I talked about it when the project was first announced. And yeah, this is the kind of project that really is such a massive, massive mix. Because, on one hand, the idea of a live-action reboot of The Lion King doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, seriously. Like, when, when you think about it... Like, considering how every single one of them that we've gotten so far, like Cinderella, Maleficent, uh, The Jungle Book, and even the upcoming Beauty and the Beast, all of them are pretty much, like, heavy CGI and all that kind of stuff. And if you're going to adapt The Lion King, then it might as well just be all animated. You're just going to make all the animals hyper-realistic and stuff like that. You know, you, you would do something like Dinosaur, in a sense. That's all you're pretty much doing. And, like... Yeah, consider and especially with how a lot of the plot elements would end up changing, like doing something like that to the Lion King, it's honestly a little bit iffy. And chances are with how Beauty and the Beast is gonna go, you know, honestly, it might not be a good sign and it could take away a lot of the trust from Disney to really make these live action reboots who like, especially when it's on one of their masterpieces, like the lion King. But then on the other hand, the guy who was going to be in charge of this project is John Favreau. And so far, John Favreau actually made so far the best live action reboot that Disney has brought to us so far, which is the jungle book. And he did a great job and it's the only one that can almost be on par with the animated classic. So, like, yeah, it's a really weird concept. But on the other hand, 
technically it is in good hands. But recently, we have gotten news regarding who is going to be among the stars in The Lion King. So that, that's another thing that I forgot to mention, by the way, is that Disney is putting this project as priority number one. So we might actually see this project come out pretty soon. Like I'm predicting either a 2019 or a 2020 release date. But in terms of the stars, the actual news that has been going on is that apparently... John Favreau has gotten Donald Glover, the star and creator of Atlanta, to go and play as Simba. But on top of that, uh, also announcing it on Twitter, he has officially announced who is also going to be playing Mufasa in the live action reboot of The Lion King. And it's actually pretty interesting on that front, because keep in mind, uh, on the original movie, he was played by James Earl Jones, and it's going to be near impossible to find someone that could be a replacement and could be a suitable heir to James Earl Jones bringing out a, a famous, beloved performance as Mufasa. Actually, scratch nearly, it actually is impossible, so screw it, let's just bring back James Earl Jones to play as Mufasa. And you know what? I ain't complaining. <laughs> that's not a bad idea at all. So yeah, that's basically the news that we have gotten is that John Favreau on Twitter has announced that both Donald Glover and James Earl Jones are going to be the stars in The Lion King. And so far, I gotta say, among the cast, it is actually pretty interesting. Even though we only got two, um, this is two in which it does actually explain a lot. You know, it does reflect upon what could potentially happen for the rest of the cast in The Lion King. Now, chances are, it doesn't look like it might actually go live action, live action, because, like, they got someone like James Earl Jones, and, yeah, he is pretty old, so it is going to be hard to see him actually running around and, you know, execute it all in a total Broadway style. I don't really see that happening anytime soon. But, uh, with that said, I will say that it is actually pretty interesting that I could actually imagine that what Disney is going to do here is like what they did with, uh, the cast of Black Panther, where we are going to see, uh, a majority of African Americans to be the stars in here. Of course, with a few exceptions, like maybe, um, white people or other races can actually, uh, could actually go and play parts like, uh, Zazu, Timon and Pumbaa, or maybe even the Hyenas, or optionally Scar, who knows, but uh, yeah, I could definitely see that it could be more of an African-American cast, which is definitely great, you know, like stay, uh, like stick more to the roots of, um, Af you know, like the African-American origins, and also one element that I have to say is the most interesting would have to be uh, the addition of bringing in James Earl Jones, because that actually opens the chance to go and bring in some of the original cast to come in to reprise their roles. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to do it with everybody. Like, I, I, I can't really imagine, like, uh, Timon and Pumbaa is going to be brought back by, by uh, Nathan Lane and, uh, hold on a sec, I just want to double check on, uh, on IMDB right over here. Yeah, like, um, I, I can't really imagine that uh, Timon and Pumbaa are going to be played once again by Nathan Lane and uh, Ernie Sabella. But what I can imagine, like, in terms of the others, it, you know, some of them are pretty hard to predict. But, um, you know, what I can imagine, what would actually be really cool, I'm thinking about the role of Rafiki. It's either A they would actually bring back Robert, uh, Robert Guillaume to play as Rafiki, or, uh, hold on a sec, uh, there, there's just one other person that, uh, that I have an idea about who could play in there, and, uh, trying to think, trying to think, trying to think, uh, fudge nabbit, uh, there we, uh, um, 
Ah, fudge net it. Okay. No, but uh, as I was saying, oh, wait. Oh, there we go. There we go. Here it is. Here it is. Okay. It's either Robert Guillaume or I was thinking of Tsidi Le Loca. It's either one of those two. And by the way, if you don't know, Tsidi Le Loca is actually the original Rafiki in the Broadway show of The Lion King. So that's kind of the option that you have. It's either do like Donald Glover and bring in new people, bring in James Earl Jones and have some of the original cast. Like, uh, I wouldn't be like, even maybe bring in someone like uh, Rowan Atkinson to return as Zazu or something like that, or bring in people from the original Broadway show. That would actually be really, really cool. And like, you can probably mix in the styles of both the animated feature and also the Broadway show. So we still don't know what's going to be going on with the movie itself. But it does open to so many possibilities. And who knows what could be brought up. But so far, like, it's too early to predict. Again, I could be wrong with all that I've said. Um, considering that, like, they've only brought in two people, that's it. Someone from the original movie and also a brand new guy. So maybe this is got. so maybe, like, it could work out, maybe it won't, who knows. But honestly, like, I am definitely curious to see, because this just sounds like an idea that could be absolutely fantastic, or it could actually fail. Who knows what could happen, but honestly, the only thing I could do is just wish uh, John Favreau the best of luck in doing justice to the Lion King like he did, like he gave justice to the Jungle Book. Okay, so for our next story, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a warning. Uh, this is going to be a little bit dark. This is going to be... Uh, a little bit of a serious time, and uh, yeah, this might not be pretty. And I want to talk to you guys about a little documentary that I actually found on Cartoon Brew, which apparently is called Hollywood's Greatest Trick. Now, the documentary is not necessarily long, it's 24 minutes, and if you actually go to uh, Cartoon Brew, you actually can go and find a link that can redirect you to watch this uh, documentary for free. So, some of you might be wondering, what is about Hollywood, or what is Hollywood's greatest trick? What is it about? So, basically, it looks into the life of contemporary visual effects artists. Like, how, like, what, what like, what's it like to actually work into the special effects of movies? Well, I can definitely tell you, the result is not pretty. Absolutely not. Um, and the biggest thing is that it definitely revealed a lot about what's it like to work in this kind of industry. And sadly, it's not the kind that, fe like, even though it does seem like an exciting career and you would be able to bring to life some amazing feature films, it's not really a, like, like when reality would kick in. It's not the kind of career that is a real, you know, th th I'm not saying that it's realistic. You're like, you can actually make that happen. It's not the kind that you can make for a living. Considering the treatment that visual effects artists get, it's honestly like you, you can, you can bar barely have a job with it. It's like, this is the kind that can almost purely be run by passion than it is to actually get a good paycheck. You know, it, 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 and it's actually pretty dark with what they get into because technically, like, in, in a way, I know it might sound harsh, but being a visual effects artist, it's almost like a thankless job because you would put in so many freaking hours onto, like, just one movie, even, like, more so than any other average Joe that would work nine to five. Like, some people would work overnight, some people would do, um, not, not just overnight, but also work on weekends and stuff like that, and honestly, like, if you want to work as, um, if you want to work a as a visual effects artist, don't plan out trying to raise a family and stuff like that, because, sa like, trust me, you have to have time, and you need a lot of it, to, to just a lot to spare, and, like, 
as long as you don't care about having time for yourself, it's honestly just really insane. And I do say that it is a thankless job, considering that when you look at, uh, for example, the, uh, the Jungle Book, the 2016 reboot of The Jungle Book. Sure, the visual effects get a lot of praise, but when you hear people talking about um, how amazing it is, how they brought in, like how they really updated classic Disney characters to the new era, they don't thank the visual effects artists first to really like make them ama to make them a lot more realistic, to make them look grand, to make them look b really believable. No, the first people that they thank is the act. Uh, they, it's the actors. They thank Bill Murray. They thank Scarlett Johansson. They thank uh, Ben Kingsley. They thank uh, Christopher Walken. They thank Idris Elba. They thank those people. But the the special effects artists, however, what they do is that they have to work like a hundred times longer and harder than any of those celebrities have done. I'm not saying that the actors uh, barely did anything. But when you compare the amount of time that the visual effects artists have to work on the movie compared to the, the amount of time that the uh, celebrities have to perform as either like Baloo, Bagheera, Shere Khan, and Ka, yeah, I mean, it, it, like they, like they, it's, it, it's almost like the celebrities, they, like, you know, they, they live luxuriously, just don't work a lot. And then you got all those guys that are pretty much working themselves to the bone. And another factor that is really big is regarding the paycheck. Oh boy, they get so underpaid. And this is another thing that the uh, documentary really emphasizes, is that at one point they did talk about gravity and how apparently like, uh, like someone like Sandra Bullock would actually be in gravity and she would be paid like a good ton while the visual effects artist like I said before, they can barely actually make a living. And you know, that's kind of sad in a sense. But at the same time, they also mention about a lot of the recent controversies regarding uh, the, t you know, when they try to spread awareness about the horrible livelihoods of working onto special effects. Like uh, the biggest controversy that, like when they tried to make a lot of voice, uh, when they try to raise a voice, actually, was at the Oscars when The Life of Pi actually won for Best Visual Effects. And, like, they, they wanted to have a discussion about, like, how it is to be a visual effects artist and stuff like that. And they were pretty much, like, shoved off on the side. Like, immediately, they would just play uh, the outro music saying that, yay! It's those guys. Congratulations. All right, let's just move on. You, you know, stuff like that. And what happened was um, the big strike for visual effects artists, you know, it, it, and uh, they do bring in some other elements as well, like what they would wish to do. And the biggest thing, like their ultimate goal would be a union, which let's be honest, many visual effects artists are not under union and that would be something that could guarantee them to have like a good livelihood not just uh for money purposes but also freaking mentally because some people can go actually insane for working way too hard uh on a movie you know like they can have a massive burnout and they can go absolutely ins insane to the point that they would need substance like alcohol in order to at least continue or worst case scenario, continue just living, you know, and, it, and, it, and sometimes it really is sad. Like they, like they just want to do it just so they can have their credits be a part of like a big name movie, you know, like, uh, and, and honestly, I would have to say that overall, the visual effects industry is definitely something that is run p almost purely by passion because these people want to make these special effects come to life. They want to go 
and create the Autobots from Transformers. They want to make the superheroes super like in the Marvel movies and all that kind of stuff. Now, I know that technically <laughs> now, I, like probably at one point, some of you are probably wondering, wait a minute, this is not about animation. This is about visual effects. Well, in a way, working in visual effects is not necessarily too different than working in animation. And, like, we can also have another debate regarding how the livelihoods of, uh, like, the livelihood of people working on animation is not necessarily that grand either. And plus the fact that, you know, that they would need a union and stuff like that. Like, th that, that could be, like, an, another subject in its entirety but yeah basically working on visual effects and working on animation it's a lot like siblings in a sense they're not necessarily that different even though like at first they're two like like they're cr from two completely different fields but in the end of the day they're not really that different they do a lot of the same things in a sense so yeah honestly if you guys want to learn a lot more about the modern life of visual effects artists, then I highly recommend you guys go and check out Hollywood's greatest tricks and uh, see for yourself how it's not necessarily that great to learn about um, uh, about working in the visual effects industry. And if I ever turned you off from going into that field, I just want to say <laughs> I am so sorry. I didn't mean to turn you off from it. I'm not saying to not work in the visual effects industry. It's just um, see for yourself how these guys live their lives. Okay, yeah, we, we kind of really were in a downer mood talking about the terrible livelihood of uh, visual effects artists and all that kind of stuff. I really am sorry for that, guys. Let's try to lighten up a bit and talk about some robots. Yeah, you know, robots are cool, right? Well, apparently in Japan, they are actually developing a robot that people can actually build for themselves and, uh, you know, like really turn turn it into life. Uh, and this is like a pretty big robot that can actually do a lot. In fact, this is more of a communication robot, someone that you can uh, legitimately talk to and all that kind of stuff. And apparently this project is called the Atom Project where basically people can create their own robot that pretty much ends up looking exactly like Astro Boy, which is pretty much why, like, Adam is the name, uh, is pretty much the Japanese name for Astro Boy. So, some of you are probably wondering, what is it about? Okay, so apparently several companies in Japan, these include Tezuka Productions, NTT, NTT Docomo, Fujisoft, Vio, and... Ko, uh, Kodansha, they announced that they are releasing a weekly uh, magazine where they would talk about something called Atom Project, which, like I said before, is a communication robot uh, modeled after Astro Boy. Now, they have already released several videos of what this uh, Astro Boy robot could actually do. And uh, so far, the functionalities that we have seen, they would include introducing himself, singing happy birthday, along with saying the person's name, which, oh, by the way, I just want to mention that right now I am I am uh, taking my source here through Anime News Network. Uh, he can do self-diagnosis and also can recognize faces of up to 12 family members thanks to an onboard camera. And uh, on top of that, they really uh, uh, maybe I already said this, but they have already released uh, several little 30 second videos about what this is all about. Now, that's actually pretty cool. But how is it that you can make this? Now, I did mention that this is something that you can build and it's like a weekly thing. So well, what is it all about? So apparently the way that you go and build this Astro Boy robot is that you have to sign up to or you have to pretty much get this weekly magazine called uh, Shu, uh, Shukan Tetsua, uh, Tetsuan Atom o Tsukuro. Yeah, that's basically it. Shu, uh, Shukan Tetsu, uh, Tetsuan Atom o Tsuko. Man, my Japanese is horrible, right? <laughs> uh, which 
which it pretty much uh, is uh, in English. It's weekly. Let's build Astro Boy. And every week when you get this magazine, you would get one piece of the robot in which ultimately you have to go and build yourself. And the price range, it can really vary. It can be so many different things. Like the first issue is going to be the cheapest. Uh, you can pretty much get it for 830 yen, which is uh, more than $7 US. But then you'll end up with a total of seven, uh, 70 different issues. And the price range, like more often than not, they can go a little bit low, like uh, more than 1800. Uh, yeah, more than 1800 yen, which is about more than 16 bucks US. Or they can go into the higher end, like uh, 2300 yen or just $20 US. Or like they can go like super expensive, like uh, the highest one that they have put up in uh, Anime News Network. Uh, apparently, the, like, the most expensive magazine with a piece would be about 9,250 uh, 9, yen or somewhere around more than $80. So if you are thinking of trying to get all these weekly issues along with the pieces to build this Astro Boy robot, it would cost you a grand total of... <clears throat> A one hundred eighty four thousand four hundred and seventy four yen or in U.S. money. That is more than sixteen hundred dollars before the taxes. Now, there is actually a way that you don't necessarily need to have all the, like you don't need to go and like buy issues separately. There is a way that you can actually go and buy it pre-built like you could get all the set like uh, apparently it says the project promises that the entire kit can be assembled with just one screwdriver for people who don't want to build it vio is offering 1000 pre-built sets for <clears throat> 212,900 yen or almost $1900 US for this one friggin' robot. So you'll prop you'll pretty much end up paying like either between uh, at the low end probably around 17 or 1800 uh, $1800 US or around 1900 or 2000 dollars US. It's insane and really it's insane. And I'm looking at the price like that robot better be like freaking super intelligent because so far it doesn't necessarily offer a lot. Like um, the one thing that it didn't list on uh, Anime News Network is that it is a walking robot. Like you see this Mega Man robot just walking around and like you just see it do all these tiny little tasks like sing happy birthday and then clapping at the end um, and then just recognizing people like, oh my God, there's this one like really weird and corny uh, little commercial that they did where every like all the family members are just gathered around the table where this astro boy robot is and like they were just talking to it and like all they were doing is just like being stupefied like the, it's like as corny as an infomercial like they were just there like astro boy how are you doing i am fine wow that's amazing! You know, all of that crazy stuff. But, yeah, honestly, I need to learn a lot more about this Astro Boy robot to make sure that if it's going to, to cost around, like, ultimately between $1,700 and $2,000 US, like, oh my god, th this thing has to be, like, an actual legit robot. Like, this better be the closest thing to what we usually get in the TV shows and all that kind of stuff. Because seriously, this Astro Boy is just... Like, that that's just insane. And I know that this is not the first time that they're doing this, uh... Kind of like, uh, you, you get this issue every week and you'll get a piece to ultimately create this, uh, giant thing. I know it's not the first time, but my god. Like, honestly... Even though it is um, my first, like, uh, like this is the first time that I'm noticing it, but 
Jeez, it better it, it honestly better be worth it. But yeah, like if you guys are interested in getting it, then uh, just head yourself to Japan and subscribe yourself to the weekly Let's Build Astro Boy and uh, go end up spending so much freaking money and hopefully that Astro Boy robot is worth it. And so finally, we now have Matt's pick of the week. And as you may know, the Academy Awards are just around the corner. And if you are an animation fan, then I know for a fact that you are going to be paying very close attention to the category of Best Animated Feature. The moment that you're going to find out who is going to win between Zootopia, Kubo and the Two Strings, Moana, The Red Turtle, and My Life as a Zucchini. On top of paying attention also to some of the other categories that surprisingly, animation has decided to put a few prints onto. Including Best Original Song, where Moana and Trolls can be found, and also Best Visual Effects, where surprisingly, Kubo and the Two Strings became the second ever animated or fully animated feature to be nominated in that category. But there is one in particular that, unfortunately, a lot of people decided to overlook. They didn't necessarily care much about it. And I'm talking, of course, about the Best Animated Shorts category. Now, I'm not saying that anybody who watches the Oscars should pay attention onto all the categories and know what they should be about. Because, like, even, admittedly, even myself, I am guilty of not even knowing many of the other movies that are nominated, you know, like, I don't really know much about any of the movies in Best Foreign Flicks or Best Documentary, with the exception of Life Animated, and or Best do uh, Documentary Short or Best Live Action Short or any of those things. But I feel like, as someone who is a fan of animation, I want to do myself a favor and try to increase my knowledge about knowing what these Best Animated Short projects are. You know, not just root for the one that I've seen in front of a Disney movie and just go from there. No, 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 no. Now, I've already made myself a pledge a while back that I would watch, like, all the things that are nominated in terms of uh, the Oscars that are... At, yeah, all the things animated that are nominated at the Oscars. Now, rather it be before or after, I would go and check them out. And so far, I've been doing very well, I have to say. And the thing is, is that with this one, in terms of uh, best animated shorts category, now chances are maybe it's a little bit too late to do any sort of research and stuff like that. And I know that not many people would be able to go and check out all of the uh, shorts that are actually nominated. So I decided why not actually go and create something that could be like the next best thing to actually watching these shorts. Give you guys as much information as I can about these shorts individually so you would know what these shorts are and why is it that they won and maybe pique your interest to go and check them out for yourselves maybe. So I decided to go and develop something that I would like to call Animat's Guide to the Animated Shorts that are nominated at the Academy Awards. Or something like that. Somewhere around that line. But you get what I mean. So what I'm going to do for you guys is that I am going to be looking at each of the animated shorts. And try to give you a little bit uh, of a description of what they are. And maybe a little bit of my thoughts on each of these shorts individually. I actually managed to watch them myself. Um, I actually got the opportunity to go and actually get on iTunes, uh, there's a little thing that you can actually go and buy the, uh, be like, you can pretty much go and buy all of the best animated shorts category and just watch them one by one on top of the ones that didn't necessarily get nominated but were on the short list. So, with all that said, uh, let me start things off with the first one called Blind Vaisha, which, um... If you don't know, uh, which uh, Blind Vaisha is directed by Theodore Ushev, Ushev, sorry about that, Theodore Ushev, and it is actually created at the National Film Board of Canada. Now, usually, believe it or not, National Film Board of Canada is actually a very strong powerhouse uh, in the Best Animated Shorts category at the Oscars, debatably even more than Disney, believe it or not. 
And, ba and uh, what this is, is uh, the story about Blind Vaisha is that you got this girl and she's not necessarily blind, but the way that she sees the world is entirely different. Where in one eye, she can only see what was the past. And on the other eye, she can only see the future. Now, how this works is that, let's say, Blind Vaisha would look at me. She cannot see me for who I am now. She can only see me where, in one eye, she sees me as this nine-year-old. Where, on the other eye, she sees me as this old man. And... Throughout the whole thing, it's mostly uh, people trying to cooperate with it, how Vaisha tries to cooperate with it, and it's not really working well, and she can't really get in touch with reality, until at the end, where it decides to go and give the audience a big moral, uh, pretty much trying to say, if you were Vaisha, which eye do you want to see from? Do you only want to see the past? Or do you want to only see the future? And that's pretty much the big ultimatum that this decided to, uh, that this uh, animated short decided to go and bring out. Now, the one thing I will say about Blind Vaisha is that among all the ones, uh, all, all the animated shorts here, this is probably the one I was, I would have to say that it is the most artistic. Uh, the one where the story that it's trying to say is executed in a way that's just being a, sto a classical story. Where you have like a narrator and it ends in a moral and all that kind of stuff. But also, in terms of the art style, it definitely is very unique. Where it's trying to mix animation with something that I like to call... Uh, well, not I like to call, but something that's called lino cut. And if you don't know what lino cut is... Line of Cut is basically a combination of printing and carving. I've done some Lino Cuts myself. It's not as fun. It's a really, really tricky technique. Like, if you're able to master that, then my god, you are an amazing artist. But yeah, like, if you want some examples of Lino Cuts, uh, just go and look it up. Now, of course... Um, Ushev didn't necessarily actually use, like, traditional lino cut techniques to go and create the animation. That's not the case. Uh, what he did is mostly using, uh, modern technology like a cynic tablet in order to execute the lino cut style. And yeah, like, in terms of the, uh, and like I said before, it definitely is the most artistic and definitely the most unique short that we have over here. On top with uh, giving its audience a massive thinking piece about how would you wish to perceive the world if you're unable to see how the world is today. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, Blind Vaisha has already gathered some uh, awards for itself. Um, this has already apparently, re uh, it already received the Cartoon Network Award for Best Narrative Short Animation, and also the Canadian Film Institute Award for Best Canadian Animation at the Ottawa International Animation Festival. Uh, the film was also included in the list of, Can of Canada's Top 10 Shorts of 2016, selected by a panel of filmmakers and industry professionals organized by the uh, Toronto International Film Festival, which, by the way, I'm writing, uh, I'm reading all this through uh, Wikipedia. And don't worry, they are sourced, so it is pretty legit. So, yeah, that's the information that you need to know about Blind Vaisha. It's the more artistic one. And then we got Borrowed Time. Now, Borrowed Time is actually something that I've already talked about here in the animation podcast but luckily, now it actually did get a nomination, so allow me to explain to you a bit more about what Borrow Time is. Now, apparently, we're going back to the Old West, and you have this sheriff who decided to go back to this uh, mountain cliff where he, wa he was there a long time ago with his dad. But apparently, like, we actually see some flashbacks the, uh, from the sheriff when he was a kid just hanging out with his dad and you know they were just you know they were just riding along 
And uh, at one point, there were some thieves or some bad guys that were trying to shoot him. And apparently, the horses or or pretty much um, the go- the sheriff didn't necessarily see the cliff, so he pretty much fell off. And his dad, like he fell he fell off the cliff, but he's pretty much hanging on to dear life. And well, if I continue, then uh, that would be spoiler territory. But what is actually very interesting about Borrow Time is that I have to say, this is a legit Pixar quality animated short directed. And uh, by the way, this is directed by a- Andrew Coates and Lou Hamu Lihaj. And yeah, like I said, this is an absolute Pixar quality animated short. And I'm not saying that because this is my opinion. I'm actually saying that because this is at legitimately made at Pixar. Uh, this was apparently the first ever animated project done from the Pixar co-op program, uh, which is uh, w- which pretty much allows their Pixar animators to go and produce their own independent films, which all the time they would go and create the uh, anime they they would go and create live action shorts but these guys decided to go a step further and create an actual animated short with Pixar's technology and they spent like 5 years producing this from 2010 and 2015 and throughout the time they would get help from other Pixar animators and producers and all that kind of stuff to go and create it uh in fact let me just read a little bit uh, saying that the directors worked on the film in their spare time while remaining full-time at Pixar and, contr- and contributing to projects such as Inside Out, Brave, The Good Dinosaur, and WALL-E, along with other shorts, including Day and Night, uh, the Toy Story shorts, uh, well, the Toy Story TV specials, and Partly Cloudy. And yeah, like, honestly, just looking at this, it, it, it's probably the one, for me personally, I am rooting for the most uh, to actually win here, because where Blind Vaisha is the most artistic, this is probably the one where I find myself to be the most emotionally invested. Not only that it looks absolutely phenomenal with the way that they're actually using Pixar's technology to go and create this amazing animated short, but even through concept alone, it is actually, it, it, like, you get really invested into it. A lot of action and really just a lot of heartbreaking moments. Like, this is something that you guys absolutely have to go check out. In fact, if you go on Vimeo, you can actually go and watch this short for free. So at least you can have that. So, uh, yeah, that's the little information that I can gather up for you guys for borrowed Time. And now let's move on to the longest animated short that we have over here, which is called Pear Cider and Cigarettes. Unlike the other animated shorts that are just between six to eight minutes long, Pear Cider and Cigarettes is like 35 minutes long. And apparently it says right here that it's uh, apparently a Canadian animated short documentary which I'm not 100% sure if that is actually, like, based on a true story or something like that. Hold on, let me actually double check on something. Uh, ju- or, well, like, I could definitely do agree that the, the way that it's done, it's a little bit like a documentary, but rather the, the fact, if it's actually a true story, that would honestly really surprise me. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, maybe not. Um... Oh, or is it, uh, no, actually, no, it's not, it's not, never mind. I'm looking more into Animation World Network, and, uh, all it's saying is that, uh, although first written as a graphic novel, uh, Parasiter and Cigarettes was always intended to be a film, which, uh, oh, it's just, it's just the way that it's described. Like, um, it's described as a documentary that happens to be animated, where, uh, or no, wait a minute, wait, actually, no, it is a true story, holy crap, it's a true story, whoa, oh, crap, oh, bo- whoa, dude, okay, sweet, merciful Neptune, okay, that I did not expect, wow, okay, so it is a true story, okay, so, yeah, it is a, 
animated documentary almost in the same veins as Waltz with Bashir. All right. But anyways, I'm getting a little bit too ahead of myself. Before I go on, uh, let me describe to you a little bit of what this documentary is about. So, Pear Cider and Cigarettes is the story of a guy named Techno Stipes. And Techno Stipes, he's more of a rebel. Like, we look into his life and, like... Ever since he was a kid, he's always been causing a lot of trouble, just living on the edge, and just going to the extreme and stuff like that. You know, like, more of a daredevil, always want to go and pick fights, you know, always finds a way to go sleep with women, and all that kind of crazy stuff. But, when you do these stupid things, stupid consequences would go and occur. And he would end up screwing his body so much... To the point that he really destroyed his liver. And he was pretty much desperate to go and find a, a liver transplant. Considering that his record is really bad. So uh, Techno decided to go to China. And from there we see his life is not necessarily going as well. And especially the fact that. Uh, after his accidents, he became a massive alcohol, uh, a massive alcoholic, which is why this is called pear cider and cigarettes, because those are the things that he loves to do. And well, he loves to drink. He loves to smoke. So, yeah, he's not doing any favors for his own body. But uh, with all that said, the, the rest of the mission is to try to get him like, you know, to get him out of China, to get home and to get a new liver transplant. And uh, this is all told through the eyes of the guy who made this, the director, the writer, and all that kind of stuff, Robert Valley. And yeah, this is definitely rather unique. You know, considering that this is a, uh, a documentary, you know, it, it does give me a brand new perspective on Parasite and Cigarettes. It is actually really, really interesting how we see just the life of, of this guy who, who's like... He's basically an all-out troublemaker, and even after the accidents that happened to him, he's still a troublemaker nonetheless. You know, it's definitely one of the more interesting ones. And uh, another element that I would like to add is the art style. I'm sure that they're going with Robert Valley's signature art style, which, uh, if I may go a little bit onto uh, what he has done, apparently... Uh, Robert Valley is actually, uh, he, he, like, his most well-known works would actually include uh, working on Aeon Flux, and he was the character designer of Tron Uprising. Uh, apparently, it says, uh, his latest success as an Annie Award-winning character designer for Disney's Tron animated... Uh, wait a minute. Is not really... Oh. I don't know. It's just this article here on uh, on, on uh, Wikipedia. It's just, I don't know. It just doesn't sound right. Like, okay, he's a, a, an award-winning character designer for the Tron animated series, Aeon Flux, Gorillas, Beatles Rock Band, Tron Firebreather, and DC Comics uh, Wonder Woman. Oh, DC Comics Wonder Woman clips. And, it, and yeah, it actually is true. Like, uh, the fact that it did bring up Gorillas and stuff like uh, Rock Band... Yeah, I could definitely do see the art style. It does actually seem pretty familiar because the best way that I could describe it is that the art style in Pear Cider and Cigarettes, it's, it does seem a little bit like a mix of Gorillas and Grand Theft Auto. Like the art style, not, not in the game, but at least in the cover art and stuff like that, at least in terms of the use of color. So yeah, uh, one more thing that I would like to mention about Parasite and Cigarettes is that this has already won an Annie Award for Best Animated Special Production. So this has already gotten an award under its belt. All right, so with that said though, let us move on to the next project, which is Pearl, directed by Patrick Osborne, which for some of you animation fans, that name could actually be familiar, considering that he already did won an Oscar for Best Animated Short when he did Feast, which is the animated short about the little dog that loves to eat food that was um, that aired before Big Hero 6. 
And what's actually very interesting about Pearl, before I get into the story, is that this is actually a very uh, historical film, actually, in terms of the Oscars, because this is the first time ever that a virtual reality film actually got a nomination at the Oscars. Yes, this is actually a Google Spotlight story uh, that... For the first time ever, it actually got uh, an, a, an Oscar nomination and it already got itself three Annie Awards where it actually won for uh, Best Directing, Best Music and Best Production Design, all for an animated TV slash broadcast production. Now, what is Pearl about, you may ask? Well, apparently this is the story about a girl who lives her life entirely in this old car. Like, she doesn't have a house or anything. She lives in a car where her dad, at one point, well, like, he was just crossing, like, he was just crossing the country, and he was uh, a street singer. Like, you would see this guy playing on the side of the street on his guitar, and you're supposed to throw money at him. Uh, well, not throw, throw money at him, but just, like, pitch in, like, a buck or two on uh, his trunk. Like, that, that's basically his life. And then he decided, uh, ultimately, to go and get uh, and get a job for the sake of his daughter. And then her daughter would ultimately grow up and, you know, act like any other angsty teen. And she decided to, sh you know, to pass on the torch to living the dream as a musician like her father did and just be a part of a band. And ultimately, throughout the whole time, you hear this song that her dad would play and then uh, ultimately she would be the one to sing. Uh, I don't know, like compared to the other ones, this doesn't necessarily stand out as much. Like, yeah, yeah, I think um, like just watching it by itself through uh, what, what I just did, just seeing it as a short, it didn't necessarily do a lot. I'm sure it's probably a lot more effective if you watch it on Google Spotlight stories with uh, virtual reality, although I don't have any Android project, uh, pro I don't have any Android products myself. I'm just waiting until Apple can ultimately go into the levels of virtual reality, so um, I can actually go and do that myself. But yeah, so uh, that that's definitely uh, I, I can imagine this being a, a tough competitor here uh, among all the nominations. And so, finally, this will come to our last, but certainly not least, uh, animated short right over here. And the one that is the most popular that everyone is probably familiar with, it is Piper. And if you don't know what Piper is, it is the animated short that appeared before Finding Dory. Now, the story right over here is that you got this little baby sandpiper, and for the first time, um... Her mo uh, his mother is not feeding him uh, like she's not going to do the job. She wants she wants her baby Piper to be a big boy and actually get the food himself like all the other Pipers are. But after a little a little uh, slip up accident, Piper is scared of the water. So it actually requires the help of his newly found crab friend to go and conquer his fear of the water. And I just want to say this right now. Like, I'm not the kind of guy to say this about animated shorts or animated projects or whatever. Like, I would normally never say this. But my god, this freaking short is adorable. I mean, freaking seriously. That little Piper bird is so freaking cute, especially with the little Krabby. Oh my god, it's adorable. This thing is just, it's like, it makes you happy just watching it. It's such a really feel-good animated short, so much so, in fact, this was the animated short that won for Best Animated Short at the Annie Awards. So, would that reflect upon uh, how it's going to do at the Oscars? That I don't know. But yeah, um, what, but one thing I will say about Piper that I really do like, though, is uh, not only is it adorable, but... The amount of realism that they put in, like, oh my god, like, they really went down into detail to make this short as realistic as possible. Not necessarily on the birds, but just on the environment. Like, uh, every, like, the way that you see every grain of sand, 
um, like all the water and the foam and just all that kind of stuff. Like in a technological matter, this is absolutely phenomenal. But just through the concept and the story alone, it is a lot more simple than any of the other cat, uh, the other nominations. But it definitely is adorable. But yeah, so basically, this is all the nominations for Best Animated Short. And hopefully, you guys do get a good idea of what these are. So, just a little bit of a recap of what you have right over here. You got Blind Vaisha, which is the most artistic one. You got Borrowed Time, which is um, the, the one that is from Pixar and the most emotional one. You got Pear Cider and Cigarettes, which is the longest one. And uh, the one that really goes into detail about uh, a true story. And then you got Pearl, which is coming from uh, someone who has already won an Oscar. So this guy knows what he's doing. And then you got Piper, which is the Pixar one. So those are all your nominations for Best Animated Short. And hopefully... Um, this could either interest you guys to go and check it out. Like I said, I found it through iTunes by going to the iTunes store and looking up, uh, best, uh, best animated short. If you guys are willing to spend money on it, um, well, like hopefully maybe you would be interested in seeing it or that, uh, or you are actually well aware of what these animated shorts are and that hopefully... Like, you do get a good idea of what these are, so when one of them would win, you would understand why. But anyways, that is pretty much it that I got for this week, so thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Animation Podcast. You can find more of my work at film-book.com. All you have to do is search for Metzger Brunette or the Animation Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at Animat505. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes or any other podcast service, do you mind doing us a little favor and rate and review this episode? That would be wonderful. And if you are listening to this podcast on iTunes, then hit that little like button on our video and leave us a little comment on your thoughts on the news this week. Tune in next week for the latest episode of the Animation Podcast and all things animation. Thank you guys so much for listening. And until next week, see you later, dudes.